Let's Talk HR is a place for HR professionals, business owners, and employees to come together and share experiences, to talk about what's working and what's not, how we can improve best practices so that companies can better attract, train, and retain all generations of workers. We all know that there has been a huge shift in what people want. Generations are coming together more than ever on what's important. Mental health has been brought to the forefront of everyone's mind. Let's humanize these conversations. Let's talk about how the economy has been impacted and what needs to happen to find a balance. I'm your host, Leon Lovely. So let's get this conversation started. And remember, if you enjoyed this episode, follow us, like us, and share us. I'd like to welcome my guest this week, Kevin White. He is a high-stakes business therapist for The White Group. As a high-stakes business therapist, Kevin thrives in situations where there is a lot on the line and specializes in one-on-one work for business owners struggling with addiction. When the business needs additional support, Jamie, Kevin's wife, and he work together to navigate these situations as a team. They are uniquely positioned to support small business owners and their spouses and the leadership teams who navigate the opportunities and challenges that come when the stakes are high. Having been through many of those critical moments himself, Kevin has been thankful for those that have been in his corner during those times. After 20 years of marriage and riding the roller coaster that comes with the struggles of overcoming addiction, he really believes in the power of empathy and love-based therapies for people side of business. Kevin, I am so excited that you have joined me today, and I'm really excited to learn a little bit about your background and, and kind of find out you know, the direction that you're going today, because you and I have talked prior to this show, and there's there's so many things, you know, on your plate right now. So why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? And, and again, welcome to the show. All right. Well, thank you. Yes, I've been looking forward to this conversation as well. Uh, so starting back at the beginning, I grew up in Iowa, very rural area. I met my wife, who was from Wisconsin and moved to Wisconsin. I started out of high school in IT, and I spent 20 years in IT. I still am working out of some IT roles, finishing up some projects, and uh, am transitioning into doing more coaching with people around addiction, around business, around some more completely different topics that uh, I learned along the way. Really, my journey in IT started as like a network person, setting up computers, setting up networks and all of that. And then I was fortunate through the family businesses that I was a part of to grow into several different roles, roles ending up doing more and more database work. And looking back, I found out that what I really liked about it was the relationships and the people that I was working with. So as I got into more like business intelligence roles, what I was really looking for and what I really liked was the conversations and the people I was meeting, right? So I'm not an analytical person, even though I work on data warehouses today and I do all this you know, very analytical work, I'm, I'm usually involved in the front end of that, or the, like, I guess, I don't know what the right term is, but the front end of that work, meaning I'm working with the clients on the end product and on uh, giving them what they need to conduct their business. And so I think the common thread in my life between my first career and what is turning out to be my second career is that I'm a real people person. I, I love what people present. Um, uh, I love the story of, of who you are and, and what you bring to the world and, and how you can contribute and how we contribute to each other. And so I think that's, that's the, the gist of who I am. You know, it's so, so completely interesting that you, um, what you just said, because um, long, long ago, I, 
I went to school for computer programming. Um, and a, a class and an internship short of my degree, I went, I don't, I don't really want to do this for everything you just said, which is I love people. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be in front of people and I didn't see a, co a career in computer programming having that exposure to, to people. But you have found a way to have a career in IT and still have that exposure by working with people. But now you are, you're kind of entering into, with what you have been doing um, with your current role and, and doing a little bit of coaching and, and what you're, you're going into with the white group, you've been doing some coaching and well, your wife has been doing some coaching with businesses. You do some individualized coaching and now you're kind of launching your own thing where you're going to get to do a lot more individualized help and, and things like that. Correct? Yeah. So along the journey, so I worked with, let's see, four small businesses. Okay. So the first two were family businesses. And I say that because there was more than one family member working in them. And then the second two were pretty much single proprietors and they didn't really have a family that was involved at all in the business. I remember I worked for a consultant out of Madison and he, I got really close with him and he, he had a very successful business that went from when I started around 15 people to when I left around 60 in a seven year period. I remember him asking me as I was switching roles because I was involved in sales and I was involved in, in implementation and then I was involved in this data stuff. And he's like, Kevin, what do you really want to do? Like, I'm confused about what it is that you want to focus on. And I was having trouble answering that at the time. I think that for me, it's kind of a story of a late maturity. <laughs> um, you know, like my dad and my grandpa were like computers. And my dad told me when I was young that let's do something you love and you're, you're going to find your way that way. And so I took that to heart. I did that. And I did like, I liked the part about computers I liked is the seeking of knowledge, the um, figuring it out, the challenge, the, the ability to help others through, through that medium, through that technology. And so that, that was part of my journey and certainly is a part that I love. But I think that now that I've been through a little bit more of life and I've dealt with some of the, my own issues that I've gotten to a state now where I really see a way that I can help people directly, you know, and, and it still might be business related, but a lot of the work is around the person. That's amazing that, you know, and each one of us are defined by the journeys that we take. You've had an interesting journey, um, not only with the career that you've that you've had, the career that you're leaving, um, and, and I, I shouldn't say leaving, um, but you're, you know, in the IT world, the IT, IT realm has been obviously an amazing career because you're still, you're still doing that. But on the flip side of that, you've also been involved with the white group and, and tell me a little bit more about, you know, the idea and the concepts behind how that developed and came to fruition. And then, you know, tell me where things are with that right now and, and your involvement in that. About in 2017, my wife started working with a coach named Mark King, who is in uh, the Milwaukee area. He works in Chicago and Milwaukee. Somewhere along her journey with him, he, he was helping with her family business. She works for her dad. So he was helping them with their communication and stuff like that. And I had had some questions about I, something I can't remember. And she said, maybe you should talk to Mark about it. So I started working with him and that has, that's been a, almost a four year journey now, um, coming up on four years where I've been working with Mark on the company I was, I'm currently transitioning out of as well as just myself and my own uh, fears that come out in my communication, that kind of stuff. So what 
that work uncovered is just how much along with like half the world that seems like that's turning into coaches like how much opportunity we have inside of us when we talk about hr uh, i think that there's just the, the whole idea of humans as resources how are resources for each other how how much potential we have um that's i guess the journey that has been there for me in the last four years as far as like how where i'm taking that i, I think that i've originally i just thought all right i'm gonna work with with teams of people and try to uncover some of how they're making we're making everything so stressful when it doesn't have to be mm -hmm. um as a consultant i've been involved in huge projects some projects this isn't talked a lot a lot some projects that are really big actually completely fail I was involved in, you know, like a half a million dollar failure in part of my career. And so when you go through some of those situations, especially in bigger companies, you want to figure out how do we actually succeed at this? How do we do something big and completely make it work? Right. And so that was my original focus for the business, for the white group. Mm -hmm. um, since then, as we've better defined what we're doing, I've focused a little bit more on uh, addiction specifically, which is my story okay. um, and where I came from. So we're doing kind of the same thing, but with, with an approach of like supporting business people that are dealing with addiction, if, if that makes sense. It's niching down to, you know, getting into a, a small area of helping people instead of that broad area of, well, I'm going to help IT teams, you know, Right. And that, you know, it, it, you said something that, that resonated with me, niching down into that small area, which is, I think, that what we all need to do. Um, you know, businesses out there used to say, okay, we're going to have every service in the world so that we can try to help everybody. That's no longer, I think, what people want. They want to be able to call one company that is the absolute expert on whatever mm -hmm that 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 thing that they need is so yeah. uh I, because yeah if i call you know if i call my doctor's office and i have you know a broken finger and they say well we specialize on toes I, you know i, I don't want to talk to them yes. <laughs> i want to talk to the finger guy yes so uh, that i mean that's great that's that's awesome and there are so many things happening in the world today one being addiction, um, mental health, whether that be related to addiction, whether that be related to what's happened with the pandemic. Um, mm. I mean, I, the list could go on, but that's amazing for not only to take that from kind of that life coach standpoint, but from the business standpoint, because people forget that just because you may be a successful business person, doesn't mean that you don't have some demons or <laughs> skeletons in your closet. I think I said this to you, you know, the first time we talked, the more money you have doesn't necessarily mean that problems go away. It, it typically means the bigger the problems get. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean that I, I commend you on that. Tell me a little bit if you're open to it about your story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, behind everything I told you is the story of my addiction, right? So starting when I was a kid, so um, I was, uh, and I can confidently say now, but like, basically, it was a long journey in the last, I would say, six years away from addiction, but um, with different stages that I could identify for you. But so I was uh, a porn addict that started when I was a kid. And something happened to me that was fairly similar a lot of guys that i've talked to have been exposed to that type of material very young no big deal right like it's like part of life so why was i interested in it well when you dig in and kind of the work that i've done in the healing process is i was exposed i was vulnerable to it because I, I just moved to a new uh, school i think i'm naturally curious i'm possibly a little more have a more open to addic addictive personality than other people possibly. Mm -hmm. I think we find that among addicts that we have a certain, we have certain 
uh, traits that maybe make us more open to it. Right. Um, but really when it comes down to it, it's like the rejection I was feeling in my new school, um, you know, even with living on a block with like 40 kids, like all the dynamics of what was happening in my neighborhood. And, and, you know, I wasn't dealing with that very well. And mm -hmm. so I was looking for uh, over the period of the rest of my school life, uh, when I was exposed to that type of thing, I was using that as a, as a cover up for um the pain i was feeling um and i think that we would probably say that this is similar for almost all addictions there's a there's a commonality here in that it's a coping thing right it's it's um we're, we don't want to address pain we don't want to and then but we get new problems right we have shame now and all these new things so right it's behind so behind everything we talked about i was dealing with that in my relationship i was married my wife was dealing with most of the problems with those what, what was going on so i don't know how much you want to get into all of the specifics around this because it's a big story but like yes that's my that's my journey and part of the reason why i think it's so important in business to support people's mental health because of course no no owner no manager that i had knew that that was there and i'm not saying that it's not always appropriate for managers to know this but I think one reason why coaching is a thing is because like, and, and coaching in business, even life coaching in business is a thing is because I started working like my, my journey more recently has been working with a coach on business things, right? Like right. On how I'm communicating with the team, how, how can I serve my team members better? How can I understand them better? All of those things that's a really safe place to work on some of these things that are impacting us internally. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so then, but then we can extend it beyond that. We can take it into our personal life, into our relationships, into our relationship with our kids. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm seeing with, I would say a very broad community that's focused across many needs. One thing that I'm focused on and that I see some other coaches focused on is this concept of, Hey, business is a great w area where we can work on ourselves. We can work together. We can work on how we communicate better, how we leverage each other better, how we support each other better. And then those things that we learn at work, we can bring home. Correct. And we spend so much time at work that yes. if, if we're able to work on ourselves at work and be able to work on ourselves at home, whether that if we need additional help through a mental health provider or through a doctor, we're able to hone in on that when we're on our personal time. But if we're working with somebody at work as well on trying to figure out areas of, of need there, I mean, think about how powerful that can be. I mean, putting those two things together um, is, is that's an extremely strong thing. And to have people who are brave enough to come in and talk about their addictions um, in a public forum um, is just, it's an amazing thing to do because, again, very much like all of the other conversations that are happening out there around mental health and around, um, you know, neurodiversity and around, uh, again, the list goes on. These are the conversations that need to happen so that people no longer think of, oh my gosh, that's such a bad, horrible thing. Yes. I mean, we, we need to, we need to have those conversations in order to make people, you know, realize that this is happening and it could be happening to you. It could be happening to a family member, your neighbor, it could be happening to your coworker and you may have no idea, you yes. know, your best friends could be, you know, hiding booze all over their house and you may have no idea, you know, and, and p some people may be laughing at that, but I, I know yeah. somebody who, you know, Hey, I had absolutely no idea that they were drinking from the time they woke up in the morning until the time that they went to bed. I, I mean, I've, I've experienced myself where I had no idea that a very close friend of mine was a severe alcoholic until one day I, I found the booze mm -hmm. and I went, I, I had no I I had no idea. Yes. Yeah. And those are those are things that need to be addressed, not just at home, 
but at work mm-hmm. at on a on a whole person level yes it's not just now i want to go back a little bit um mm-hmm. You know, and I don't want to dig in too much to anything that you don't want to talk about, but, you know, you were telling your story and then you kind of jumped into the business sense of it. Obviously, your story, um, you know, has had a huge impact on on you. And, and at some point you had that aha moment where you went, I, I want to I want to beat this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if that started with you working with a coach and thinking I can overcome this or I can work through. And I don't know that I'm using the right terminology. So forgive me if um, I'm, I'm being naive here, but you know, I don't know if it's, if you're a recovering, if you're, you know, I don't know what, how you use those terms. So again, at some point you had to have had an, an aha moment and go, okay, I, I want to do better. I want to be better for, the people I work with and for my family. Do, do you have a moment that it kind of happened for you when you, when you dug in and decided I'm, I'm going to, you know, and, and how was that affecting? Was it affecting your work? Was it affecting your family? Wow. So that was a, that's a lot of questions. Sorry. <laughs> but, I'm sorry. I do that a lot where I ask like eight questions at the same time. Yeah. Let me think. So, Yes, there, there's, there was more than one, but for sure, my wife is pretty much all of them. Okay. So if you were just imagine for a second, the person who's listening, right? Having, especially if you're a woman, having a relationship with an addict that where they're not available to you really mentally. Okay. So because addicts are in our minds, you know, we're, we're thinking about way too many things that have nothing to do with reality. Um, how we're going to look, find other people, how we're going to cope, uh, especially with me, with her, um, since this type of addiction affects our relationship um, as a married couple, there was a lot that certainly I didn't understand and she didn't understand either about the ins and outs of our relationship. So the, the big awakening points were when she was like, even though she was aware of what was going on to a certain extent, uh, where she would just be like, okay, I'm not accepting this type of behavior, this selfish behavior. Let's just call it that. I'm not accepting this selfish behavior. Um, I, think, I, I think I would probably go with two points that made a difference, and they were both related to her. One is when she committed to me that she wasn't going to leave the relationship. But two, when she said, I'm not going to tolerate emotional abuse or anything that has to do with you being selfish, right? Because this is about us having a healthy relationship. Right. So those two things were the, the main points that led to healing, if, if that makes sense. It, it absolutely does. And... I would assume that at that point you kind of were scrambling around saying, okay, now what, how do I, how do I do better? Oh, for sure. And like, and especially in one particular moment that I remember, although this really didn't, I think there was more than one. Right. But anyway, there's a couple of times where I had to choose. Okay. I want to be, I can be, I can say, go live in my brother's house. Who's a, who's an alcoholic or I can, choose my family. I have six boys. I didn't through all of this. We, we have a two year old and all the way up to 19, but, um, I had to basically work through those. Well, it's a very extensive process that we can't obviously get into just because of time, but, um, I had to choose between, do I just want to be a bachelor living in, or, you know, with my brother and just, have very unhealthy relationships or do I want a future with my soulmate, you know, with someone that, uh, I really appreciate and, and, and love to have in my life along with my kids. What do I want to, what do I want them to see? Um, do I want to see them uh, or what I, do I want them to see me give up or do I want to be there for them if they're having to address something like that? And so, I mean, as simple as it sounds, like there's an obvious answer here, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 
in those moments, it was actually hard um, because of how messed up I was, right, in my mind. But, right. Um, but I do think it wasn't like uh, all the excuses I had about how I was actually fine and didn't have a problem um, were the things that held me back, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that answers all your questions. It, it does. I mean, it, it, it paints a picture to where you're headed now. Yes. <laughs> so tell me about that. Yeah. So I've been working with my friends and uh, actually I've, I've been doing some life coaching for addicts and then I've been working with business people who are my friends. And originally I was thinking that I would work with business and like with teams, with leadership teams, with business owners and support them. And like, so kind of what you, you talked about, uh, whereas they don't always understand where their employees are coming from and they get into a situation where there is a conflict or there is something that they don't completely understand. And I'd be there to support both sides. Um, but the goal is to support the business, right? Because it's mm -hmm. greater than any one party. However, along the journey, I had, I definitely had success with other addicts, uh, in particular, one man that, man, he, he just um, kind of had the same thing happen where his wife's like, I, I've had enough of this. And our wives knew each other. And we started working and like a year and a half later, he was completely different. He changed his career. He, he, he was just awesome. And I, it was so much fun. I was like, man, I'd love to do more of this. Um, but I didn't think I could put both of them together. But as I've been talking with people about business, business people that are addicts, it's like everyone's coming to me and saying, yes, this is the thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not planning to go around and tell a bunch of people about the people I'm working with in the future, right? Because this is a private thing and that's, they have to do that. They have mm -hmm. to tell you. But I mean, what we're really dealing with here with a lot of this mental stuff is the shame of what's going on in our lives. You know, the things that the dirty part of our lives that we don't want to share with people. And what that, what that does in the workplace is it's, it's making us have fake relationships, right? Because we're not being vulnerable about who we really are. And as soon as we start, we flip the switch and we start really telling people about whatever it is that is a problem in our life or at least a struggle in our life, okay? The more that we find connections with people that can help us to be a, our best version of ourselves, and the more we can support each other. Right. Once you humanize somebody, once you become vulnerable and they become human in your eyes and no longer this shell of a person or the ideal human you take them off that pedestal of being perfect all of the sudden all of the the fakeness gets washed away and I will tell you that there are many people who in my career that I've looked at and went wow that he has to be perfect because he's so successful and he's so, and I idolized him. And instead of, you know, having, and then when you find out like, oh, he's got, you know, this, or he's getting a divorce or you, you go, oh, well, he's, yeah. he's just human. Mm -hmm. And, and you humanize these people. And all of a sudden the fear of, well, what if I screw up in front of him? Or what if I, uh, you know, it, it washes away and, and people, can actually then build genuine connections with each other. And it's an amazing thing. Yes. It absolutely is an amazing thing. And it needs to happen more. I and agree. I'm not, again, I'm not saying that everybody should go and, and dump their bag of laundry out on the conference room table. Yes. <laughs> it, it, but, you know, again, it just, it needs to happen naturally. People yes. can build more genuine relationships by being more human with who they truly are be, by being authentic. And I think that we all have seen that over this last 20 months, 22 months, whatever, whatever it is now. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just another step in that. And I agree. the world 
the world needs help right now. Yep. It, we, all, we all have, I mean, life is, is a challenge. It's also a great opportunity. I think there's, I think that there's a huge benefit to what's happening. I shouldn't say a benefit. It's a potential benefit. What's happening with all of this change in the workplace and where we're working and the, the hybrid working and all of those things, I think it gives us an opportunity to provide new tools mm -hmm. for employees and for, for business people. I don't know. I don't have the answers, right? And what that looks like. I have, I think, I think coaching is one tool that could be helpful, but I think that the answer is probably different for most businesses. Like there's, you know, like maybe your HR team is already well situated and has good relationships with the company and can offer more around mental support. You would probably know more about that kind of stuff than I would. Or maybe you need, maybe there's like having someone that has that role in the business around mental health or I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. Like that's, I think that's the, the beauty of what we get to explore together in the business community is how do we, we have the opportunity. How do we take that opportunity and turn it into something? Yeah, no, I, and it's, it's a scary thought. It's a scary thought to think, um, well, one, let me back up. It's, it's amazing to think that we could have somebody who's specifically hired at a company to handle mental health or handle employee wellness or it's also a scary thought because I don't know that if they're employed by the company a lot of employees wouldn't be completely honest at this at this time in the world because they'd be like well I'm not going to go in and tell them about my mm -hmm. whatever it might be my addiction to this I'm going to get fired yes. um, but maybe at some point in the world will be able to get to, to that point yeah. where, where that would never happen, where <clears throat> a company truly cares enough that they'll say there is, you know, whatever you say to this person cannot be, you know, disclosed, cannot go. But then you always run that fine line. If, if a company is aware that somebody is addicted to heroin and they're responsible for driving a forklift or, yeah. Where is the liability fall? Yeah. You know, there's always there's always something. So yes. that and that's why a lot of employees are so scared of, you know, I'm an alcoholic, but I have a job that requires me to use equipment of yeah. some kind. And that's that that fear will always stay or resonate with them. And who do they go to? How do they get help? If it's yeah, through a so company, that's, that's a good point. I right. think that sometimes I live in this alternative universe. Um, <laughs> no, not, I, again, but, this is my HR hat going on. You know, saying, no, yeah. you know, the legal aspect of things. Where sometimes I hate that it rears its ugly head, but yeah. you know. Well, I think there's I think there's a couple things in a small business. You're gonna you you can do. It doesn't have to be public support, right? Like this can be even just people that are mentors within the business mm -hmm. that are that under like especially people that have gone through something and can from the sponsorship of the business but from a more private uh approach right like they don't even necessarily have to know the details they could just encourage you to get help in a certain way like or talk to this person right, right. so i think there's a lot of more informal ways we can we can work together but i also think and i want to acknowledge some CEOs of companies, you know, not necessarily your Fortune 500, but that are out there making products and running businesses that are coming out. Right. And I think that some of those um, employees are then going to have an opportunity to say, oh, the leader is acknowledging his problem. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and this comes down to a question you said earlier, which is, you know, from an addict standpoint, is it recovering? Is it healing? Is it healed? Uh, I believe that we can heal. Okay. So I know that there's some differences in, especially the addict community around this, like, cause the 12 steps says, you know, you're recovering for the rest of your life. And I, I, I truly believe in, in healing. That's been my experience. I've had a lot of help 
I've had a lot of uh, people that have been involved. But what I'm saying is, is that mainly the the main point is that if more people come out, then it doesn't always have to be like we're standing in the conference room and everyone we all share. Our, that's not appropriate. That's not right. professional. Right. We can create groups, subgroups that aren't necessarily maybe even the liability of the company mm-hmm. sponsor some of the more popular issues that we could support each other in. Right. And maybe that's just not appropriate in certain companies, right? Like, right. I don't know that this is for everyone. And I'm not sure what the answers are. So yeah. I'm not just, I, I'm not saying that this has to be publicly acknowledged at a company, nor am I saying that you can't help a company heal if there is multiple people that you want to work with or if you're going in to work with a company coaching around this subject Mm -hmm. it's again when my you know my comment about liability and everything else that was if you are an employee of a company addressing that as yeah, yeah as an outside person going in you're not obligated to the company to report anything you don't work for that company but i think that what what you're talking about having a having people be able to come to you and work with you and have it be a service that a company offers to their employees that's an it, that's an amazing service that that could be provided because mm-hmm. some people they're not comfortable walking into an AA meeting or an NA meeting or a, and I don't know all the acronyms for all of the different addictions that are out there any you know at this time but some people that's not that's not their jam. Some people don't like group meetings like that. Some people, you know, just won't do that type of work. Some people yeah. may prefer having a private individual coach. And I I have to be honest. I've talked to a lot of people about going and just getting individual counseling through a mental health professional. Mm-hmm. And there's a waiting list right now. Yes. To become yeah. a new patient. Mm-hmm. Months and months out. Yeah. I, I mean, the world needs more people like you who are willing to have the conversations about it because you've experienced it. Yeah. What better way to learn? What better way to heal than through and with somebody who has gone through it? I, I, I would rather sit down and talk with somebody who's experienced what I'm, I'm going through than somebody who's read a book about what I've gone through. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I definitely don't want to just or like, like sometimes therapy is appropriate. Okay. Um, especially when it's, but, um, like, I'm not trying to, I'm just thinking like people are unique. I think that what I I really want to underscore about what you just said is, for me, and I think a lot of certain types of addictions, there's like a lot of shame. Some are more, in, a, like it's more common that, well, I'm addicted to cigarettes, big deal, right? Yep. Oh, I'm addicted to food, uh, big deal. Um, alcohol is a little more shameful. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, there's some addictions, like definitely pornography addiction, is there's a lot of shame related to it, okay? Right. It's, we're embarrassed about that we're doing that and, and who in the world wants to talk about it. Um, so I think that for me as an introvert, my journey has been with not just my coach. It was other there. I had someone I had several people that were helping me. Okay. Um, I, I, yes, I think that having a more one-on-one work is a thing and can be done. And mainly, if I want, if I just speak to the addicts for a second, if anyone's listening or if you know of an addict, our main problem is shame about coming out and saying, hey, I'm an addict, right? And that's why I, I don't want to get help. So the biggest thing is if you can tell someone and if you can tell someone that already knows what you're going through, that's great as well. But if you want to make a change in your life and, and I'm speaking to someone that that is affected by addiction tell someone all right just get the courage to tell someone what you find is we're all human 
we all make mistakes and most of the time people want to be there for you it might not be that they can help you but they might know someone that can so i think it's important to to just get over that it, it's going to hurt it's painful it's shameful it, it, it's a thing but you're going to feel so much better when you start to to heal from it thank you i i mean and and I encourage anybody who is listening to this who is interested in getting help. And I wanna I wanna make sure that my comment was not misunderstood. I I am not discouraging going to a, a, a psychiatrist, a therapist in any way, shape, or form. Something yeah. like this is an amazing thing that you're doing. It it truly is. And um, you know, I'm gonna flip this over to you to do a little self promotion. Um, you know, if somebody is interested in reaching out to you and wants to have a conversation about this, how can they reach out to you? How can they, um, you know, learn more about you? Sure. Uh, you can email me. It's probably the easiest. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Kevin White. Um, but emailing me directly is maybe the easiest way to get to me. My okay. email address is kevin at thewhitegroup.us. So Kevin at the white group that you asked. Excellent. Now we're at time, but I have one more question. This is the question of the season. If you could pinpoint a time period in your career that made a huge difference in your life or career paths, when would that be and why? Hmm. My biggest impact was I, I spoke earlier about this consultant that I worked with for in consultancy I worked for in, in Madison, Wisconsin. And I that was the biggest impact in my career. And it was really because in that business they were completely open from top to bottom. I'll just say it in this way. I had a client that I worked for that I was a friend with before I started at this business. And two years later I had moved on to a different job. And he asked me, so did you sell the company you were working for? And I'm like, I didn't own that company. I just worked for that company. And so this company that I worked for really it established a very strong vision. They, they were open with everything from all the financials to what their goals were. Everything was open. And we had so much fun together. Uh, and I saw a business owner that believed in people that believed in what he was providing to the community and was clear on his vision and what he wanted to create. And he was, he was kind of like an economist. So it was his thing. The money, um, you know, was, was something that he could, uh, project and, and think about. And, um, yeah, anyway, so that was the biggest impact on me is, is like a business owner, that really believed in people, really invested in, in his people and invested in his business and really invested in his client relationship. That's awesome. And isn't it funny how we all, uh, you know, this so far this uh, season, every person I've talked to, it always comes back to somebody who just truly, honestly cares genuinely about people. It's, I mean, that's what it's all about. Yep. Well, Kevin, I have truly enjoyed this conversation and I have to really commend you on being so open and vulnerable and honest um, with us today. So thank you so very much. Yeah, thank you for having having me on. And I knew we would have a great conversation. Yeah, I'm glad we did. it's been awesome. All right. Have a good one. Thank you again for listening to Let's Talk HR. I appreciate your time and support. Without you, the audience, this would not be possible. So don't forget that if you enjoyed this episode, to follow us, like us, or share us. Have a wonderful day.